A very warm good morning to all of you, respected director, sir, dean, sir, dean research, dean of Ayurveda faculty, senior faculty members, junior faculty, colleagues, students present over this platform. Today, I will coordinate this uh, CSM meeting. Uh, we have two presentations today. One is from Department of Pediatric Surgery, and other is from Department of Pediatric Anesthesia, Division of Anesthesia. So, first presentation will be done from Department of Pediatric Surgery. And uh, the case is very interesting. It is a very common pediatric problem that is foreign body ingestion. Uh, so, I request Dr. Sunil to start presentation. Already, it, uh, it's time to start. So Dr. Sunil will start the presentation, and Dr. Pranay Panigri, our assistant professor, will moderate uh, pediatric surgery case presentation. So, Dr. Sunil, please start your sharing slides and start presentation. Uh, very good morning to everybody. I'm, I'll be now sharing my screen to everybody. <clears throat> So today I am presenting a baffling case of wandering button battery from the Department of Pediatric Surgery. <clears throat> First of all, presentation of the patient. A three-year-old girl, resident of Kiraka, Jaunpur, was brought to trauma center in the evening of December 19th, 2021, with chief complaints of upper abdominal pain for three days and difficulty in breathing for two hours. Parents also gave history of some foreign body ingestion three days back and trial of endoscopic removal done at some private center prior to onset of respiratory difficulty. Uh, now, according to the ATLS guidelines, we first went on to do primary survey and there were no catastrophic external hemorrhage present. Airway was patent and cervical spine was stabilized. In breathing examination, patient had uh, tachypnea with uh, saturation of 92% with oxygen and tracheal shifting towards left side with decreased movements, uh, <coughs> absent breath sounds and hyperresonance on the right side. It was suggestive of tension pneumothorax and it was immediately managed by needle thoracostomy. In circulation, patient had mild hypotension, uh, which responded to fluid bolus. There was no disability and uh, there were no signs of any external injury over the body and size 12 French Riles tube was in C2. At the end of primary survey, we a uh, size 28 French intercostal drainage tube was inserted on the right side under local anesthesia after informed consent of parents for management of right tension pneumothorax with finding of gush of air on puncturing pleura. This uh, uh, skygram also showed a foreign body present in the lower thorax with a distinct halo present around it. Now coming to secondary survey. Uh, first of all, history. The patient had history of abdominal pain for past three days, which was of sudden onset, localized to upper abdomen, constant, dull initially, but increased in severity from next day and was not relieved by medication. It was associated with decreased appetite and no association was present with vomiting, fever, constipation, bloody black stool, or radiation to other sides. Patient also had difficulty in breathing for past two hours, which was of sudden onset after some endoscopic procedure done outside. It was associated with occasional dry cough and right-sided chest pain, and not associated with any fever, bluish discoloration of body, or abnormal sounds. There were no exacerbating or elevating factors. Now coming to treatment history, parents in initially consulted a private pediatrician in Varanasi where USG abdomen was done, which was uh, <clears throat> which had non-specific findings and advised oral drugs, but no relief occurred. Next day, the pain became severe, and also child started referring to a clock. So parents again took the child to same clinic with vague suspicion of foreign body ingestion, and an X-ray chest with abdomen was done, which revealed a circular metallic foreign body in lower esophagus, and child was then referred to a private hospital surgeon. Here, rigid esophagoscopy was done, and operative notes read. Extensive charring with impacted foreign body at lower esophagus with, and foreign body could not be retrieved. So, nasogastric tube was inserted. Oxygenation and breathing pattern of the patient deteriorated soon after and the child was referred to BHU trauma center. Patient had no history of any surgical intervention, allergy or any recurrent LRTI, chronic cough, tuberculosis, cystic fibrosis. Patient has been immunized for age. Patient is a non-vegetarian by diet with decreased appetite for past three days. Bowel and bladder habits were regular, and patient had achieved all developmental milestones as per age. 
patient was a first birth order in a non consanguineous marriage with no history of respiratory diseases, any major surgical or medical illness in any of the first or second degree relatives. There is no history of contact with tuberculosis. Now, coming to examination. First of all, general examination the patient was conscious and active at the time of examination with the vitals of heart rate of 112 per minute with respiratory rate of 28 per minute. Blood pressure of 108 over uh, 72 millimeter of mercury and temperature 98.1 degree Fahrenheit. Patient maintained 98 percent oxygen saturation with uh, oxygen via mask at the rate of 5 to 6 liters per minute. Peripheries were warm and pink and Rice tube was in situ. Paler ictra cyanosis, lymphadenopathy, and edema were absent. Patient had a height of 102 centimeters and weight of 14.6 kg. Now coming to systemic examination. First of all, respiratory examination. <coughs> respiratory rate was 28 per minute. I explained. Uh, movements were equal on both sides. No accessory muscles were in use. Right ICD was in C2. Trachea was central. No cryptus was present and slight tenderness was present near ICD side. Breath sounds were equal on both the sides. Uh, patient was conscious oriented with full GCS and cardiovascular examination revealed mild <coughs> tachycardia with uh, normal audible S1, S2 without any murmur. Abdominal examination was essentially normal. So to summarize, a three-year-old girl child with a history of foreign body ingestion three days back and endoscopic intervention done elsewhere two hours back, presenting with complaints of pain abdomen for three days and difficulty in breathing for two hours, found to have right tension pneumothorax and a circular metallic foreign body with halo in lower esophagus. So my diagnosis comes to be a three-year-old girl having button battery esophagus with right-sided tension pneumothorax. Now for management. In trauma center, uh, <coughs> the, uh, right-sided tension pneumothorax was managed during primary survey by needle thoracostomy followed by right-sided ICD insertion and uh, repeat X-ray and CT thorax was done during secondary survey. To explain the findings of the CT thorax, I'll call upon my colleague from radiology, Dr. Sharoon. Good morning, everyone. So this is a coronal image which is showing a metallic foreign body in relation to the uh, distal aspect of esophagus, somewhat eccentric in location, with an associated localized uh, pneumomediastinum, which has the potential to act as a false lumen if this foreign body migrates uh, downwards. Apart from this, I have also uh, taken two images, axial images just above, and the one is, and the second one is just below the foreign body in which we can see that the esophagus is collapsed with uh, a nasogastric tube in situ. Uh, the the uh, esophageal wall is thickened and edematous, and there's also associated focal erosions and the leakage of gas in adjacent uh, mediastinum. Also, there is associated soft tissue thickening in the mediastinum, suggestive of localized mediastinitis. And there's also a subcutaneous emphysema secondary to chest tube placement and peripheral vestibular uh, consolidation, possibly secondary to re-extension, injury or edema. And here on this image, uh, axial image, just below the foreign body, we can also see a creation of a false lumen, which can act as a potential pathway for the uh, 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 caudal migration of the foreign body. And this image is taken just at the level of the uh, foreign body. Here also we can see that the uh, the metallic foreign body is impacted within the wall of the esophagus which a part of it is uh, projecting beyond the esophageal wall so to sum it up uh, we have a, a metallic foreign body a, a lithium mutton battery uh, impacted in the distal uh, esophagus with associated esophagitis and focal esophageal erosions with uh, resultant uh, localized mediastinitis and uh, adjacent pneumomediastinum which has the potential to act as a false lumen for the uh, downward migration of the foreign body thank you thank you dr sharun now for definitive management after stabilization the patient was shifted to pediatric surgery or in sir sundarlal hospital bhu next morning with a plan of rigid esophagoscopy trial under general anesthesia with or without open exploration. The instruments used for rigid esophagoscopy were Carlstow 0 degree esophagoscope with 6 mm 30 cm seat and optical alligator forceps for retrieval of foreign body. This is patient photograph on the OT table showing uh, endotracheal tube in situ and uh, 
sheath of the esophagoscopy in situ. The findings were grade three A lesions could be marked at lower esophagus, showing unhealthy mucosa with necrosis at left lateral aspect, and the foreign body could not be localized. Attempts under CM guidance revealed battery in close proximity to esophageal wall with up and down movement on ventilation. So we thought that uh, the foreign body is already passed to fundus of the stomach, and we did a laparotomy with gastrotomy intended to remove battery from stomach and to have retrograde access to lower esophagus. Distal exploration, however, revealed thickening of the left lateral wall of the lower esophagus with metal, metallic feel extraluminally. Finally, incision was given on the left dome of diaphragm from abdominal cavity and wandering button battery retrieved from thoracic cavity. Uh, Left-sided chest tube drain was placed and diaphragmic defect, diaphragm defect was closed with non-absorbable sutures in interrupted fashion. A tube gastroscopy and polypropylene transesophageal guide wire was secured with help of already present trials tube and followed by this closure were done in layers. This is patient photograph in post-op period showing transesophageal guide wire in situ and uh, left-sided ICD in situ. In post-operative period, the child was kept on IV fluids, injectable antibiotics and analgesics with gastrostomy drainage and rise tube aspiration periodically. Right ICD was removed on POD5 after ensuring no residual pneumothorax. The left ICD continued draining clear fluid that is saliva, which gradually decreased from 200 ml to 10 ml by post op day 10th. Gastrostomy feed was allowed on POD6, which was well tolerated. A thin contrast meal swallow skygram was obtained on POD14, which showed no esophageal narrowing, stricture, fistless communication with tracheobronchial tree, or extra vasation of contrast in mediastinum. Oral feeds were then allowed on POD 15th and then left ICD was removed 48 hours later. The patient was discharged with gastrostomy tube clamped and transesophageal guide wire in situ. At four weeks follow-up, the child was able to take solid food without any difficulty. And at seven weeks, check esophagoscopy was done, which showed healthy mucosa with minimal scarring. The gastrostomy and transesophageal guide wires were then removed. Now coming to discussion part. Uh, Children commonly swallow foreign bodies, most common being coins. Uh, among these foreign bodies, button batteries can cause serious injury when aspirated or swallowed. And certain patients have highest risk of high risk of lodgement, including younger patients with smaller anatomy or those with previous surgery, strictures, fistulas, functional abnormalities, or congenital malformations. Any unusual or recurrent foreign body ingestion could be a sign of psychological impairment or abuse or neglect from parents. About 80 to 90 percent cases of battery ingestion occurs in pediatric age group, with majority of them being in less than six years patients, with peak incidence in the age group of one to three years. In the last two decades, emergency room visits for battery ingestion have almost doubled. However, there has been a sevenfold increase in incidence of severe morbidity and mortality. This is due to the shift in production of larger and more powerful batteries in recent years, particularly lithium batteries, which are three volt battery instead of 1.5 volts. Something about uh, button battery. It is a single cell battery having a two part metal casing separated by an insulation. The outer casing is positive terminal, and inner one, which is narrower, is negative. The negative terminal is a crucial point for tissue damage. It can be explained by triple N, that is, the terminal is negative and necrotic. Differentiation between the button battery and coin on XL film is important. Uh, uh, halo sign can be appreciated in frontal view in magnified views in X-ray and a step off between positive and negative terminal is seen in side view. Now, anatomically, there are three constrictions in the esophagus. First, at the junction of esophagus with fairing, where most of the foreign bodies get stuck. Second, uh, uh, at the level of arch of aorta and where esophagus is compressed by left main bronchus, here 10 to 20 percent uh, foreign bodies tend to stuck. And finally, at the esophageal hiatus of diaphragm, where 20% foreign bodies tend to stuck. Several mechanisms of injury by button battery have been theorized and include local pressure necrosis, alkaline electrolyte leakage, heavy metal toxicity, and de novo alkali production from electrical current. Among these, electrical injuries by far appear to be the most likely mechanism. Animal studies have also given clue about this. <clears throat> the mucosa bridges terminals that is positive and negative terminal of the battery with resultant passage of current in the tissues, which leads to formation of hydroxide radicals, which raises local tissue pH and causes alkaline coagulative necrosis. 
this is argus grading of alkali injury esophagus and our in our case the inj uh, the injury present appreciated was grade 3a that is small scattered areas of necrosis following complications can occur after button battery injection and retrieval that is mucosal injury and stricture formation esophageal perforation with resultant mediastinitis tracheoesophageal fistulas leading to aspiration pneumonitis and in long term it can lead to formation of empyema or lung abscess spondylodiscitis and hemorrhage due to perforation of large vessels including outventric fistulas successful management demands a multidisciplinary approach including emergency room radiology anesthesia pediatric gastroenterology pediatric surgery otolaryngology and cardiothoracic surgery teams first 12 hours is crucial as, as it is the period of peak electrolysis activity and battery damage and there is a chance to have injury free removal of an esophageal battery if removed within 2 hours of ingestion Management options for retrieval of foreign body include rigid esophagoscopy, open exploration that is thoracotomy or enterotomy depending on the position of the battery, and use of magnet tube methods. Any emergent conditions need treatment in timely manner, and we should anticipate complications and manage them accordingly. So, National Capital Poison Center of USA have given a triage and treatment guideline for the management of button battery injection cases. <clears throat> I will not be explaining the full uh, protocol. But just the salient points, as we know that most of the foreign body injections are unwitnessed. It's not, see, not seen by parents. So, in any symptomatic patient presenting with airway obstruction or wheezing, drooling, vomiting, chest discomfort, difficulty in swallowing or decreased appetite with refusal to eat, or coughing, choking, or gagging while eating or drinking should uh, raise suspicion of any foreign body injection. So, X-ray should be taken, and if the battery is found to be in esophagus. It should be taken for immediate retrieval by endoscopic methods. And uh, during endoscopy, if we found any mucosal in, if we find any mucosal injury, we should uh, anticipate an for late complications of battery injection after damage to mucosa. This has been our experience from 2019 to 2020 in our department with foreign bodies. Total foreign bodies removed were 1250 with 75% being of them being ingestion and 25% them being aspiration. Button batteries amounted to be around 3% cases and in nine around 9% 9 cases we required thoracotomy and or laparotomy for retrieval. So I'll hand over the mic to my moderator. Thank you Dr. Sunil. Uh, so this is an interesting case actually because we see a very uh, large number of foreign bodies in that uh, getting a button battery case is also present and uh, usually these patients have like uh, they, they present between uh, 6 hours to 12 hours of ingestion but in this case the baby was manipulated outside and the baby also had an uh, tension pneumothorax which is very rare presentation of uh, complication of button battery. So, uh, so we uh, thought of presenting this case because uh, though it's a button battery ingestion within 48 hours, so we had a rare presentation of uh, pneumothorax. Secondly, for all of our uh, medicals and uh, doctors, we just need to emphasize that uh, button battery ingestion is always dangerous. It's a catastrophic event. So, everyone have to refer the patient very quick uh, to the nearest tertiary center. And uh, the button battery and coin have to be differentiated by the history uh, if the parents are giving, or else uh, X-ray. So our take-home message is always prevention is better than cure. Now companies are also coming with many uh, different ideas. Like now batteries are there in battery nets. Uh, they are uh, like in a specialized case in which the baby cannot manipulate the battery from the uh, toy or from the wristwatch. Second, uh, the batteries are also uh, now uh, made in a manner that the battery after compression only will discharge current, but in a normal time it will not discharge current. So that if also uh, the battery is ingested by the patient, uh, the baby, then it will not uh, discharge current. And uh, finally, uh, always education is uh, the ultimate thing. We have to educate our uh, fellow uh, beings and all parents. 
so that we have to uh, avoid toys and uh, battery toys uh, from children thank you uh we need to like uh the whole of the ot uh, setup and the challenging case uh, was dealt by our uh, anesthesia team so thank you to our anesthesia team and uh, the uh, challenging mediastinitis and all this uh, um, uh, intramural uh, pocket of uh, esophageal uh, battery was commented by our radiology team. Uh, so we uh, heartily thank our radiology team also. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sunil and Dr. Pranay for finally completing your presentation. So now I will take uh, questions from chat box. I request uh, Professor Sanjeevita, sir, please unmute, sir, and ask your question, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sarita. I've got two questions. The first one is, what was the cause for tension pneumothorax on the right side? Because ultimately, the battery was found on the left side. And my second question is that you have got a very large series of almost 1,250 cases over a period of 11 years. So what was your mortality uh, overall mortality in that big series of cases. Thank you. <clears throat> good morning, sir. Uh, sir yeah, uh, good morning. Uh, this case was actually uh, like uh, someone have uh, tried to retrieve the battery outside in a private hospital. Like our our assumption is that maybe uh, during uh, manipulation by forceps, uh, a false passage uh, from esophagus might have been done. So that may be the cause of right uh, tension pneumothorax, uh, or, or else like um, we we got the battery in the distal one third, and uh, during uh, CT scan and uh, after like at the OT table we got it on left side. So um, that was la like our assumption that maybe uh, the intervention had perforated the esophagus somewhere in that. Hello. May I uh, want to uh, like to add to this? Actually, uh, may I add to this? Please, Hello, please. good morning, ma'am. Shivi, ma'am. Sure, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Dr. Shivi. Okay, please. so good morning, sir. Actually, the uh, foreign body was in the lodge in the lower distal esophagus, and it is quite near to the azygo esophageal groove. Okay, and this is uh, very near to the mediastinal pleura. So this foreign body may any time erode the mediastinal pleura and that may have caused uh, lead, led to tension pneumothorax. And due to this tension pneumothorax, this foreign body must have shifted from right side of the esophagus to the left side. So initially it might have been towards the right side uh, near the esophag uh, esophageal groove, eroded the mediastinal pleura, led to tension pneumothorax, and then it shifted from right side to left side and then gone to the intramural pose. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. And sir, Thanks. regarding the mortality of uh, cases, sir, uh, we had, sir, some mortalities. Uh, most of the cases were post complications, like uh, in two or three cases, we had uh, uh, seen a tracheocele fistula with severe uh, pneumonia, and uh, like that was a uh, uh, little uh, challenging to uh, control the, to have the med uh, pneumonia and mediastinitis to be controlled. And uh, in uh, one or two cases, the uh, patient came very late. So we had a clear cut uh, perforation and mediastinitis. So mortality was, was there, sir, in uh, our series. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Panigi. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So now I request uh, Professor Uma Pandey, madam, ma'am, please unmute and ask your question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sarita. I, I just I was just interested in knowing that could Hamlet Manor have uh, instantly helped the toddler if the with the parents or somebody living nearby was tuned to that. But then later on, I also got the answer from Dr. Rajesh Meena that in children we do chest thrust and back slap, not Hamlet. So I would wonder if somebody would explain me what is chest thrust and back slap so that maybe I can use later in my life somewhere in my life anywhere on the flight or wherever in a village so please do so so i think i should request dr rajesh meena if he has nicely answered this question if he can explain us good morning uh, everyone actually in uh, pediatric patients less than five year of age we 
sit in a comfortable position mm -hmm. and keep the baby hold on yeah. your hand and you have to do a five back slaps and again you have to rotate your uh, baby on the opposite hand and you have to do, do a five chest thrusts and after this maneuver you have to see that the uh, foreign body has just lost into the uh, oral cavity or not if it is dislodged you can remove it otherwise you have to uh, do it again until your baby became uh, unresponsive or the uh, foreign body has dislodged if the baby is become unresponsive then you have to give again chest compressions as per the bls protocol okay it's and not this is all. I mean, I mean, I'm not able to understand it uh, fully. Maybe I'll Actually, go Actually, ma'am, ma'am, it's, it's a little bit practical thing. Uh, Maybe uh, I'll watch so, a video on Google and then perhaps understand. Yeah, 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 sure, sure, ma'am. You can video or even uh, you can attend the BLS classes uh, that was organized by our department. So mm -hmm. you can understand that. Okay. okay. Thank you, Dr. Thank Rajan. you. Thank you. Uh, now, request Dr. Abhishek Pata. Please unmute yourself and ask your question. He has some query. Dr. Abhishek Pata. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, very beautiful presentation. Uh, my initial comment was on the x-rays. No, when it was in the initial part because uh, giving just an AP view won't help. You needed an lateral view, but it becomes immaterial after the whole case has been discussed. My other uh, query is, do you think in complicated uh, cases where there is perforation and there is ongoing inflammation, um, low dose of steroid would help? Obviously, there must not be any randomized trial for that, but do, uh, in your case series, have you ever used steroids to uh, short course maybe to prevent ongoing inflammation? Thank you. Uh, good morning, sir. Sir, uh, like our anesthesia team usually go for a 24 hour steroid, but I think it's there for uh, their laryngeal and uh, edema part. I don't think uh, like we have used for any healing um, intent or to decrease the edema of uh, esophagus, but point taken, we can have an attempt to start uh, steroid for first three days at least. Thank you. Thank you. So I uh, now I request Professor Ashok Kumar, sir. So give your valuable comments and inputs. Uh, good morning. Uh, very well managed case. Uh, in these cases, uh, the parental education is extremely important because there's always a possibility that there could be a reference of foreign body inhalation or aspiration. So the young kids should be properly supervised and uh, they should not be given small objects which could be swallowed or inhaled. So in fact, the, the educational entire family is important. Otherwise, that kid can again come with the aspiration of button batteries or something else. So this becomes very crucial part of management to prevent the recurrences in future. Otherwise, very well presented case and uh, nicely managed. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So uh, in chat box, I don't think any more questions is left. So it's time to move to second presentation. So our second present. Thank you, Dr. Srin, Dr. Pranay. So our second presentation is from pediatric anesthesia, a division of anesthesia. Pediatric anesthesia is basically the backbone for pediatric surgery department. And so today presentation is very interesting a treat for tracheoesophageal fistula a neonatal surgery is uh and pediatric neonatal anesthesia is uh, itself it's very uh, challenging case so our presenter dr khushbu and uh, it will be moderated by our young assistant professor dr amrita so i request uh, dr khushbu to start your presentation thank you thank you ma'am Good morning, respected teachers. Myself, Dr. Kushbu, I'm pursuing my PDCC in pediatric anesthesia. And today I will be presenting on behalf of the Division of Pediatric Anesthesia. The topic of my presentation is TREAT for tracheoesophageal fistula, where TREAT stands for thoracoscopic repair of esophageal atresia and tracheoesophageal fistula. A two-day-old female neonate resident of Varanasi delivered by emergency cesarean section term with a birth weight of 2.2 kg presented with the chief complaints of respiratory distress, excessive secretions and intermittent cough. The child developed respiratory distress soon after birth 
which was gradually progressive with increased rate and associated with chest indrawing, nasal flaring and irritability. There were excessive secretions and intermittent cough, which developed soon after birth, requiring repeated suctioning. There was also distension of abdomen present. There was no history of cyanotic or apneic spells, seizures or atypical body movements. The child was first born out of non-consanguinous marriage and had no family history of any congenital anomalies. The mother was a 22-year-old bookcase who received iron and folic acid supplementation and had no history of hypertension or diabetes during the pregnancy. She received regular antenatal care in form of THC visits and two doses of tetanus toxoid were given. However, no antenatal ultrasound was done. There was no episode of seizure or fever and no history of teratogenic drug intake or radiation exposure. The child was delivered at 38 weeks of gestation by cesarean delivery at a government hospital and cried immediately after birth. The child developed respiratory distress soon after and the pediatrician noted inability to pass a nasogastric tube beyond 10 cm mark and so the child was referred to a higher center for further management. The child was admitted to the NICU of Pediatric Surgery Department of SSH Hospital on day 2 of life. On general physical examination, the child was lethargic with a weak cry. The abdomen was distended. The child was pink in color with no pallor or cyanosis and frothing was present at mouth and nose. The hydration was poor with dry skin, decreased skin turgor and depressed anterior fontanelle. The peripheries were cold, clammy and the capillary refill time was more than 3 seconds. The vitals were heart rate of 165 beats per minute respiratory rate of 70 per minute and the saturation was 95% on oxygen supplementation at 3 liter per minute. The anthropometric measurements were as follows. On head to toe examination, the facies were normal and the lymph morphology was also normal. No sacral dimple or spinal deformity was present. Nasogastric tube was in situ. Umbilical stump was central and dry. Genitalia were normal and the anal opening was normal in position with no meconium staining. Probe test confirmed a patent inorectal canal. On systemic examination, S1, S2 were heard with no murmur in the cardiovascular system. Respiratory system showed symmetrical chest movement with no chest deformity. Bilateral air entry was present with conducted sounds. Intercostal retractions and nasal flaring was present. Per abdomen was soft, non-tender with distension in the epigastric region. No organomegaly or dilated veins were appreciated. So we reached to a differential diagnosis of esophageal atresia with tracheoesophageal fistula, aspiration pneumonitis, pneumonia and respiratory failure. And the provisional diagnosis was esophageal atresia with or without tracheoesophageal fistula. Now I would like to call my colleague from radiology department to talk about the X-ray findings. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is digital X-ray uh, of chest and abdomen, in which we can see there is coiling of uh, nasogastric tube in the esophagus. Along with it, uh, the uh, abdominal uh, in abdomen we can see distended vowel loops filled with air. So this imaging uh, uh, picture in combination with uh, clinical history is suggestive of uh, esophageal atresia with distal tracheoesophageal fistula uh, corresponding to uh, type C of gross classification. Apart from it, uh, there are no other ab abnormalities that like there are no vertebral ab abnormalities and other rest of the structures uh, are uh, uh, unremarkable. So, on the basis of this imaging picture, uh, the, the, the diagnosis is tracheoesophageal uh, atresia with distal tracheoesophageal fistula. The routine blood investigations were within normal limits. The LFT was also within normal limit. Rapid antigen test for COVID-19 was negative. This is the pre-op ABG, which was taken after stabilization of patient on oxygen supplementation and correction of dehydration, and it shows a normal picture. 
So finally, we reached to the diagnosis of esophageal atresia with tracheoesophageal fistula, most probably of type C. And the child was planned for thoracoscopic repair of esophageal atresia and tracheoesophageal fistula to be done under general anesthesia with intermittent positive pressure ventilation and multimodal analgesia. For preoperative stabilization, the patient was put on oxygen supplementation through nasal prongs at 3 liter per minute. And to prevent further aspiration and pneumonitis, the patient was kept nil per oral with head up position and a roll under the shoulders and continuous nasogastric suctioning was done. Broad spectrum antibiotics and chest physiotherapy were started. IV fluids were given and to maintain euthermia, a radiant warmer was used. Urinary catheterization was also done. Preoperatively, we took a high risk and post operative ventilation consent from the parents of child after properly explaining the risk of anesthesia and surgery and the requirement of post operative mechanical ventilation. Intraoperatively, uh, we took the patient into the operating uh, room and the standard ESA monitors were attached. Also, a precordial stethoscope was placed. For maintaining euthermia, a forced air warmer was set and OT temperature was maintained more than 27 degrees Celsius. Head up positioning and nasogastric suctioning was done. Pre oxygenation was done using Jackson and Reese breathing system with the oxygen flow of 6 liters per minute for 5 minutes. Uh, we pre medicated the patient with glycopyrrolate and fentanyl, and after induction with titrated doses of propofol. Rigid bronchoscopy was done and the fistula was blocked by a guide wire and subsequently laryngoscopy was done using Miller Zero Blade and the trachea was intubated with an uncuffed ET tube of size 3 and the tube was fixed at 9 cm mark after ascertaining equal bilateral air entry by auscultation. The child was put on pressure control ventilation with an inspiratory pressure of 15, respiratory rate of 30. IE ratio of 1 is to 2 and a PEEP of 5. And maintenance was done on isoflurane and 100% oxygen at a MAC of 0.8 to 1 and cis atracurium 0.15 mg per kg was given for muscle relaxation. Ringer's lactate and dextrose infusion was given at the rate of 4 ml per kg per hour. Analgesia was maintained using paracetamol 15 mg per kg IV. And at the end of surgery, intercostal nerve block along with port site infiltration was given and a total of 2 ml 0.25% levobupivacaine was administered. The patient was shifted to PICU intubated and with a chest drain in C2 and put on mechanical ventilation. Now I would like to call my colleague from pediatric surgery department. Very good morning, sir. Uh, the picture shows uh, the position of the child for the surgery that is modified prone position and the K90 was placed initially to identify the upper pouch of esophagus and a nasogastric tube was placed which was used later for trans anastomotic stent, uh, stenting and the proper paddling of all pressure points were done. Uh, the second picture shows the ergonomics that is, uh, first of all, we used to uh, see that uh, the working space in neonate will be very less. That's why uh, the camera assistant sit beside the surgeon and the other assistant stand, stands in front of the operating surgeon and the anesthesia machine and all at the head side of the patient. And the second picture, so the third picture shows the port positioning uh, using the ergonomics. Now, I'd like to play a video of the surgery. Uh, we start with the dissection. We start with the dissection of fistula. Uh, fistula is dissected all, all around. And uh, first, first of all, we are incising the peritoneum and we lift the fistula. Then we ligate the fistula. And we are taking a stay on the fistula and Later, we will there will be sharp dissection of upper pouch and the anastomosis was performed using a sliding knot technique. Yeah. 
डॉल है ना मेरी छोटी सी डॉल है This is a table showing the intraoperative AVG, which was taken at 30 minutes, 60 minutes, and 90 minutes intraoperatively. The reading, which is taken at 30 minutes, it co collaborates with the uh, CO2 insufflation of 10 minutes, and we can see that the pCO2 has increased to 48 mm of Hg, corresponding to a pH of 7.33. The next reading, which is at 60 minutes, it collaborates to the CO2 insufflation of 40 minutes, and here we can see because of this uh, progressive absorption of CO2, the pCO2 has increased to 60 mm of Hg, and it corresponds to a pH of 7.2. But at this stage, the patient was hemodynamically stable and maintaining saturation within the acceptable limits, so we continued with the surgery. and after 10 to 15 minutes uh, after this reading we took the patient on uh, jackson and reese circuit and manually ventilated the patient with increased respiratory rate so the reading which is taken at 90 minutes it is about 10 minutes after the hand ventilation and here we can see that the pco2 has decreased to 49 mm of hg and the ph is around 7.3 The total duration of anesthesia was 120 minutes, and the duration of surgery was 110 minutes. A type C fistula was found and ligated in 30 minutes. The blood loss was around 10 ml, and urine output was noted. Three episodes of desaturation were seen during CO2 insufflation and ligation, and the saturation reached up to 85 percent. At this point, the surgeon was asked to temporarily stop the surgery. and patient was manually ventilated using jackson and reese breathing system one episode of tube kinking was there which was corrected this is a table showing the post operative abg which was taken at 1 hour 12 hour 24 hours and 48 hours post operatively and we can appreciate here that there is a gradual decrease in the requirement of oxygen in the neonate also there is a in, uh, a uh, proper oxygenation which is seen in the form of po2 values and also there is stabilization of pco2 the ventilatory parameters were gradually deescalated according to the abg over 48 hours and the baby was put on cpap mode of ventilation and then observed for 1 hour subsequently trachea was extubated and oxygen supplementation was started at 3 liters per minute through nasal bronchs the child maintained a saturation of 90 to 93% was active had a good cry and there was no abdominal distension seen now coming to the discussion whenever we talk about the management uh, the question always arises well, that whether or not the open approach is faster uh, when we talk about the thoracoscopic approach there is a long learning curve for the surgeon but it has been seen that with the experience and expertise of the surgeon there is a uh, the duration of uh, surgery for thoracoscopic approach is almost equal to that for open approach also the thoracoscopic approach has the added advantage of less pain due to smaller incision less splinting of diaphragm and therefore faster weaning from ventilator reduced post operative pulmonary complications and reduced cosmetic concerns like scoliosis and scarring uh talking about anesthetizing a neonate it is a challenge in itself for the anesthetist and added on to that the physiological effects of the uh, pneumocapnia in thoracoscopy causes further uh, increase in the challenges also the co2 insufflation and creation of artificial pneumothorax causes an increase in the intrathoracic pressures and this causes alteration of preload and afterload requiring meticulous fluid management right sided thoracoscopy even at low insufflation pressures causes decrease in venous return and the mean arterial pressures co2 absorption from the pneumocapnia causes hypercarbia and acidosis which is poorly tolerated in a neonate and also there is the risk of co2 embolism present the prone positioning and the placement of ports during thoracoscopy causes intraoperative displacement of endotracheal tube leading to desaturation and hypercarbia and one of the technical challenges which we face is the inaccuracy and absence of etco2 during surgical repair and herein lies the importance of abg measurement 
uh, whenever we talk about the management of thoracos uh, thoracoscopic surgeries, the classical approach is of uh, lung separation and one lung ventilation using double lumen tube to provide adequate uh, surgical field for the surgeon. But because it is difficult to find appropriate sized double lumen tube in neonates, and also the placement of single lumen tube using fiber optic bronchoscopy in the desired bronchoscope bron in the desired bronchus being cumbersome in our technique what we did was after induction of anesthesia we blocked the fistula site using a rigid guide wire and thereafter we went for normal intubation with a single lumen tube and we ventilated both the lungs equally and what we uh, found was that with the duration of surgery the CO2 insufflation was enough, even at a low pressure, to provide adequate surgical field for the surgeon to operate. Also, there was the added advantage that the ipsilateral lung also participated in ventilation and oxygenation, and the contralateral lung participated in unhindered oxygenation and ventilation. So overall, there was less incidence of hypoxia and hypercardia. In one lung ventilation, there is hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction and this can cause right to left shunting and especially through the foramen ovale and patent ductus arteriosus and this can be detrimental in the neonate and this can be avoided in our technique. Here we can see rigid bronchoscopy being performed and to locate the site and the size of the fistula and this can also help us in determining the distance of the fistula from the carina for further anesthetic management. Here we can appreciate a rigid guide wire being used to block the fistula site. And thereafter, we went for bilateral lung ventilation. And here we can see that initially the lung is inflated, but with the course of surgery, there is a deflation of the lung, which is providing adequate surgical field for the surgeon to operate. Thank you, Dr. Krishpo. So, as we mentioned, neonatal physiology is so difficult, challenging when we anesthetize a baby. And to add to it, the complex heart-lung mechanism that we encounter during the thoracoscopic surgery is actually a real challenge for us. And as of today, very few centers in India are performing such surgeries. And we are lucky enough to have this in our setup. Still, there is always a chance to, for improvement. So we have few future plans even for a better outcome. A preoperative bedside echo and a ultrasound should have been done to rule out the other congenital abnormalities. We don't have a fiber optic uh, bronchoscope as of now, but the availability can, can make it a, even better in proper placement of the endotracheal tube during intubation and looking at the fistula site. A level 2 scan could have been done at 20 weeks gestational age to roll out the vector anomaly. Use of high frequency oscillatory ventilation if done intraoperatively can provide even better uh, ventilation and control of hypercarbia and acidosis that we encountered in our case. Also, the frequent in invasive hemodynamic monitoring intraoperatively can help us to understand better the beat to bit variability and the perfusion of the baby as well as the drawing of the arterial blood gas analysis would have been even more easier if we would have placed a arterial line. So these are all our uh, plans which we want and we are even in the phase of evolution that we are trying to do in such cases and we are trying to give a, even a better outcome. So to conclude on our uh, presentation, I would like to thank the Department of Pediatric Surgery and my colleagues as well as from Department of Radiology for helping us out in this case. Thank you, Dr. Kushpu and Dr. Amrita. We are on time. So now we will go straight forward to chat box and we will start uh, questioning. So I request Professor Ashok Kumar, sir, please unmute sir, yourself and ask your question, sir. Okay, so very well presented and nicely managed case by the two units, pediatric surgery and pediatric anesthesia. Uh, well, the diagnosis here was straightforward. Any newborn baby with respiratory distress and frothing from the mouth 
and inability to pass orogastric or nasogastric tube, whatever the case, and be suspected tracheospheal fistula. In that differential diagnosis, resident put uh, respiratory failure. I mean, respiratory failure is not a etiological diagnosis. It is the consequence of pulmonary pathologies, cardiac, or maybe CNS. It should not have been there. Uh, uh, I saw, uh, yeah, during intraoperative period, PO2 levels were very high. I am concerned about it. Newborn babies, we maintain saturation PO2 levels between 6 to 80 millimeter of mercury. Pre operatively, the baby had 66 millimeter of mercury, but intraoperatively, it was 250. I think there is a concern of hyperoxia in newborn babies because antioxidant mechanisms are not well developed and we can uh, end up uh, sometimes doing more harm than good. Uh, the anesthesia team mentioned that they should have HFO during, uh, I mean, OT. But I think HFO is now easily available, uh, 20, 25 lakh rupees. So there is no reason why we should not have HFO in pediatric surgery or in OT. And uh, I don't know, Dr. Sarita, do we have a division of neonatal surgery here? As such, uh, separate division is not there, so we... I but think now, now you should move in that direction, should have a division of neonatal surgery because we have a good number of babies with surgical problems, mostly congenital in nature or developmental or in nature. And you need a specially trained pediatric surgeons. Who, uh, of course, all pediatric surgeons are looking after newborn babies, but now the time is coming there. The, they have to further subspecialize in looking after newborn babies, especially premature babies and very tiny ones, because size is one of the major factors which determine the outcome of these babies. And you need persons who are specially trained to handle those uh, tiny kids and tiny patients. Yes. Otherwise, very well managed case. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. sir I would like to add actually, uh, sir, as you told, PO2 level is actually very high in, uh, intraoperatively, but actually there is no supply of air in pediatric OT. So we had to give 100% oxygen to the baby. So that is the reason why we are not. Well, this is something very strange that there is no oxygen. Yes. There is no air in OT. Sir, we, I, I'm expected, I we are doing such advanced surgery, but there's a lack of air. So th th this is a system problem. And I think we yes. need to look into it and uh, rectify it at the earliest. Sir, we are fighting, Sarita, for, oh yes, what's sir, your take? fighting for this for last three years. I tried my what best. I've written so many letters. Sir, sir. So, 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 year ke liye itna fight karna padega. But I, I never realized it. Then uh, I'm sure so many babies must have been exposed to hyperoxia, and in newborn babies, especially in preterm babies, hyperoxic lung injury, brain injury, eye injury is very common. I think we need to look into it. This is something very serious. Yes, Lack sir, of yes. air in OT. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, sir. So, uh. Now I request Professor Uma, Uma Pandey, ma'am. Ma'am, have so many queries. Ma'am, please unmute yourself. Yes, I, I do have uh, many queries. Thank you, Dr. Sarita. The most important reason for being so curious in this case, because I have had a family member, very close person to me, who have had this tracheoesophageal fistula baby, and who was operated in 2006 in All India, New Delhi. That baby is doing very well. That's not a baby anymore. That's a teenager now. So I was involved and I was so affected by that case. That time, I think the weight of the baby was dropped to 1.3 kilograms. So first question, first, first. Uh, uh, but I must say that this is a very well managed case and very advanced care of management, which I didn't see at that time. At that time, they did tracheostomy uh, for that um, child as well. So uh, was this baby low birth weight? Was, was this baby preterm 2.2 kilograms baby at 32 weeks? 38 weeks, sorry, uh, and a premature rupture of membrane is not premature because the baby's mother is 38 weeks. So did I miss something while while listening to the case or is it something I'm not sure? Ma'am, it's a low birth weight actually, I, I think yeah. by mistake. It was a term baby, ma'am, we have written, mentioned that it's a term baby with a low birth weight of 2.2 kilo. Even but it where, was... Where from the PROM comes? Ma'am, it's a, for this indication for pre premature rupture of membrane, the emergency CS was done. Now, um, uh, I, I, as far as I know, because I also read about tracheoesophageal fistula, the, the best, the, the, 
was shocked to me was that why can't why couldn't ultrasound diagnose that baby and that's my sister and so i read a lot about this case and i realized that majority of the times they, in this baby uh, shok chaudhary sir is here so he will correct me because i'm not a pediatrician or an anatologist uh, but the moment you feed these babies they will become blue and this is what happened to this baby i witnessed so that is very surprising that and this cyanosis may not be all over it may not be central it could be just peripheral it could be just in the fingers but that baby developed cyanotic spells every time it was breastfed or whatever and it says in the literature as well and and the last thing uh, uh, yeah that's all i wanted to say actually rest everything i've already mentioned thank you for uh, dr sarita for giving me the chance to speak out so the cause of uh, cyanosis or respiratory distress or choking could be feeding because when the, whenever the baby is fed, the yes, milk sir. will trickle into the, the trachea and yes, baby but it could have happen. a choking. So, so, so once you suspect a tracheal fistula, the feeding is uh, contraindicated and then suction has to be done, which they did in this case, uh, I mean, preoperatively. So, yeah. and some of, some of the cases could be diagnosed antenatally. But then not every case will be diagnosed antenatally. Uh, sometimes there may be history of polyhydramnios in these cases. And uh, I mean, so many things uh, to be so done. Those in these I was talking to people who do prenatal scanning, sir. I'm, I'm not the expert yes, of prenatal yes. scanning. Yeah, yeah. Uh, mostly, I, I spoke to many people from here, from abroad, because at that time I was in England. And most of the people said that diagnosing tracheoesophageal fistula antenatally is not an easy job. Yes, it's quite difficult. It's quite difficult. Uh, any radiologist can uh, very well comment on this. Yeah, 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 that would be interesting. Ashish sir was there. I, I saw his message. Uh, Professor Ashish Verma sir, sir, are you there? Or Dr. Shivi Jain is with us. She can uh, give comments on this. Hello. Ah, yeah, please, Shivi. Oh. The, the diagnosis of this tracheoesophageal fistula can be uh, made antenatally, but definitely it is not an easy job because uh, we know that fetus is always moving. So it may not be detected in a single scan. Many a times if there is a suspicion uh, due to some uh, polyhydramnios, then we may have to do the repeat scan. Sometimes indirect clues may give you the diagnosis. When you fail to see the gastric bubble or you have an associated polyhydramnios and many a times some associated syndrome, then only you may think about it. Right. Thank you, Thank Dr. You. Thank you, Dr. Shivi, for very valuable comments. So now we are coming to the end. So uh, now uh, may I request our honorable director, sir, to give final comments on today's CSM presentation. Sir, please. Thank you, Dr. Sita. So both the presentation very nicely presented and uh, well managed also. First uh, pediatric surgery case it was very well managed and uh, child uh, as was shown doing very well, taking solid meals at that time. Now, of course, it is two months almost. Uh, I think it was done in December. So well managed. Congratulations to the department. And second also by the pediatric anesthesia, this uh, TF case, very well managed, learned a lot about these uh, management parts and uh, I congratulate to them also. So nice presentation, but your comment that uh, you are fighting for here in the OT for the last three years is also news to me. So we'll look into it. Why when this uh, uh, MGPS work is done Why it is not part of that at that time only why it is left out. I'm surprised that such works are not taken in total, but uh, in piecemeal that uh, that should be part at that time only no tip without uh, these uh, MGPS including here can work properly. So we we'll look into it, but um, it's really I can't say fighting for air in the uh, OT is uh, really, really very disappointing, but uh, definitely we'll look into it. But as far as cases are there, both the departments, departments presented very well and well managed. Congratulations and thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Shivi. Thank you, Dr. Sita. Thank you, Dr. Shivi. Thank you, Dr. Sita. Thank you, Dr. Sita. Thank you, Dr. Sita.
Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So we are hoping for uh, help from you, sir. So we always get help from you. And again, we are looking at you, sir, for this also. So thank you. So now we are coming to the end of this CSM session. Thank you all for joining us. So with this, I'm ending this session. Thank you all. Thank you.